Hey WayFam, we're so excited to see you here on a Way World Outreach Sermon. Thank you for tuning in. Now let's get ready for this week's word. Let's get started in this word tonight. Tonight we're doing part two of part three of a sermon that, series that we've been on. So it's called the four keys to producing a harvest. And right now we're talking about the third, the third key, the third thing that's really important for us to understand is there's one thing that chokes out our harvest. And what is it called? It's a weed. What is it called? A weed. And there's different things that will hinder our harvest. Things like um, when, when, we let, when we allow Satan to take our word or to cause us to be offended. You know, when someone's up here preaching, they're not preaching, you know, because they read enti your entire Facebook story and they know what you've been talking about and what you've been doing. And so if you've ever felt like, who told them about my story? Who told them what I went through? It, no one did. It's the Lord that's just speaking to us, and that's what's happening. But sometimes we allow Satan to steal our word or steal the seed because we get offended out of a message. We get offended out of a word. So, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't, uh, we said this last week, medicine doesn't taste good, but we need it, right? How many of oh, we need it? So there's another way that this seed gets stolen. It's sometimes we allow difficult times to take us over. So when we're going through a tough time, we allow the waves and the storm to conquer us. But every time Jesus was in the boat with his disciples in a storm, one, one of the times he was walking on water. The other time he was taking a nap in the boat. And this isn't a little Galilean fishing boat. And these don't got all these sails and they don't got, you know, they don't have a little bottom room like a yacht. They don't, you don't have a nice comfy bed. If it's raining, the entire boat is wet. If water's getting in the thing, it's wet on the floor. And he was taking a nap. Now, I wonder how many of us are looking at our lives, and we see storms and difficult times, and we think, how am I going to get out of this? I I'm either going to die, or some I'm going to be in a shipwreck. Something bad is going to happen in my life right now. When Jesus is taking a little nap. Why is Jesus taking a nap? Because he's not concerned. Because those waves can't overpower the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And so anytime you're in a storm, don't worry. God's got you. Don't worry. God's got you. We talked about this last week. Don't worry. Pray. So God's got you. And then we also talked about how we need to do some weeding. We need to do some weeding. Right? Now, I did some more research on what weeds are. And weeds actually have a very, very interesting, uh, very interesting, yeah, part of life. There you go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> they, 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 they attack in a very interesting way. And they have a, a, an assignment that they do. Weeds are a wild plant that is growing where it is not wanted. This is a definition of a weed. A wild plant that's growing where it's not wanted. Weeds affect everyone in the world by reducing crop yields and crop quality, delaying or interfering with harvesting. So anytime you see a weed, its whole agenda and its whole course of life is intended to, to choke something out, things that are intended to give us life and to produce something. But it's funny, this, this, this thing says, a wild plant that's growing where it's not wanted. Well, I got a question for everyone tonight. Do you want your weeds? Do you want them? None of us want weeds. Why? Because they grow into places that we want life to happen. They grow in the places that we want to see a harvest. They grow in the areas that we want to see something good come out of it. But I'll give you an example. Uh, some of us have, right now, we, we have a family, you have a marriage. And there's little weeds that the enemy's been planting, little word of the enemy that he's been planting in your marriage, but you don't want weeds in your marriage. Because weeds are intended to choke out the good things in, in, in your marriage and in your life. So the only, the only places that weeds grow are places we don't want them to grow. There's no such thing as a weed that grows in a place we want it to grow. Like what would be great is, is if weeds grew in, you know, like our, 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 our weight. So that, you know, they could choke up all the fat and, the, and help us to slim up a little bit. That'd be, that'd be cool. How many guys would say I would sign up for that right away? Well, but it don't work that way. Weeds grow where you don't want them to grow. So anytime, when we talked about this last week, and this is just a little bit of review. Anytime you see a weed, you got to deal with it right away. Because a weed, a weed, and, and this, here's another thing. 
Another thing, and, and it's a good thing. A, a, a weed, when you identify a weed in your life, it's only growing in the places that are meant to produce good in your life. So sometimes you're, you're, you're going to say, oh, the church is full of hypocrites, and I get offended there, and this person didn't say my seed, and oh, man, I got cut off, and I didn't get a parking spot, and it's raining, and blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I don't know how many different things we can think of. Well, those weeds are only going to grow and choke out and pluck up and suffocate the thing that is meant to be good in your life. Now, I guarantee you this. The enemy is not going to do, he's, he's going to make sure that he, he, he paves a clean road, no weeds, when, when, whenever, you, when, whenever you go down the wrong course of your life. So when we go down the right course of our life, the enemy plants seed and weeds to try and choke out the good thing. But the enemy doesn't plant seeds in the areas and weeds in the areas that, that, are, that are in the trajectory of, 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 of destruction in our life. So weeds are only growing places that are good, the places that we don't want them to grow. And weeds, are, they're really interesting. They also do this. They, they have this adaptation to spread. They're adapted in a way so that they spread very fast. How many guys are those dandelions and you just like, little kid, you pick them up and you just like, blow them, blow them in the air? That's a, that's a weed. And its whole goal, anytime the wind comes up, it floats around, it looks pretty, and the kids play with them. Those weeds, those things go out and they spread all over the yard. They're adapted, and it's not the only one. Weeds are adapted so they can spread very fast. And how many of us haven't dealt with the weeds in our life, and we're allowing them to spread in all the other good areas? See, when an enemy plants a weed in your marriage, it's not just going to stop there. It's going to go off into your kids. And then when it's planting into your kids, it's not just going to stop there. It's going to go off into your kids' kids. And then it becomes a generational curse and something you have to deal with in generations. And see, when the enemy plants the weed in your finances, it doesn't just stop there. It goes on into your depression. It goes on into anxiety. It goes on to all these things we talked about. And, and, but it doesn't just stop there. It's adapted to be able to spread and spread and spread. Not only that, but weeds have this thing called seed dormancy. Seed dormancy. And what that is, a weed is able to be dormant for a long time and sprout up at the worst possible moment. So some of us have brushed weeds under the rug, thinking that took care of it. As long as it's not causing anything right now, I'm not really thinking about it, but have we dealt with it? Have we dealt with forgiving the person that hurt you? Have we dealt with reconciling yourself back to God? Have you dealt with the addiction? Have you dealt with that thing? Or have we just brushed it under the rug? See, dormancy will cause that thing to wake up, it sparks up the season shift, and as soon as, you, as, soon as your season shifts, it, it's like a trigger for that seed to wake back up and sprout. I told you guys I had a backyard full of, full of dirt for the longest time, and out of nowhere, all this green started sprouting up. I thought it was beautiful, I loved it, I was like, wow, this is good, but I recognized it wasn't grass, so if it wasn't grass, it had to have been a weed, but I was like, hey, this is not so bad, I'll take it, I like this. But it was dormant seed that was there from a long time ago. It has this thing called roots, and the type of roots that a weed has, it goes really deep, and it's very, very strong. It's the same kind of root that tree has, and, it, and those roots are intended to be hard to pull out, and they're able to last very severe conditions. So you could, you could have, I'm t and this is why I'm saying this, and I'm not trying to, this is not like gardening 101 today, okay? I, I have, there's, I'm going somewhere with this, all right? <laughs> I'm going somewhere with it. Listen, there's a reason for that. When, when, when these weeds are, are difficult to pull out and they can last severe conditions, here's why. Because there's only one. There's, someone say there's only one. There's only one name by which we're saved. There's only one person that we have the victory. There's only one that can set us free. So we try all these other things. We try counseling. We try pills. We try all this, that, and the other. We try to go work out. We try to make more money. Maybe that'll make us more happy. We try to do all these things. Maybe it's my status. Maybe it's my position at work. Or maybe it's if I get in a relationship right now, I'll be happier. None of those things. You'll be searching and searching and searching, and you won't find because those weeds are intended to be adapted, and they, they fight all these other things. Things, but there's only one person and one name that can set you free, and his name is Jesus Christ. No one else can do it except the name of Jesus. So we talked last week about some, one of the weeds is anxiety and worry. Today we're going to talk about two other weeds, the love of money, the love of money, and putting things before God. See, the love of money over God, it says in verse, uh, in, uh, we're, we're, in, we're, we're, we're reading out of Mark chapter 4, 
But in verse 18, it says, the seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth. Here's something to always remember. Hoard the seed and you will hinder your harvest. You hoard your seed and you will hinder your harvest. What do I mean by hoarding the seed? What we do is we think that in order to be prosperous, we have to hold on to everything that comes our way. We have to hoard it. Now, this is not a popular message, okay? So, it's probably going to get quiet, but it's all right. Don't get quiet on me now. You, your harvest is hindered when you hoard seed. How can a farmer expect to get any fruit from a field if all he does is eat all of his seed? How can any farmer expect to get more and to get a surplus and to, get, and to, and to continue to increase his life as long as he's holding on to his seed? Seed is meant to be planted. And so when we hoard the seed, we hinder our harvest. I wonder how many of us are right now walking and living in poverty, not because God didn't bless you, but because we've been hoarding the seed. We've been hoarding the key to your blessing. There's keys that God has already given you. Release a blessing that God has already been giving you. And but what we do, we walk as if God is not the blesser. We walk as if we have to maintain our blessing. I have to hold on to this. If not, I'm going to be in lack. I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm afraid about my... What, when, we, when we walk and we live that way, what we're really telling God is God is not enough for us. He is not a provider. He is not a blesser. And I need to be in charge of the finances or in the surplus of my life. But when we live that way, we start hoarding the seed. When you hoard the seed... More than just your, if you are affected, we, we, we plug the flow of God's blessings. We plug the flow. Now, when I get blessed, I am, it's not meant to stop with me. Because it didn't start with me. I mean, it came from God. Since the beginning of time, it came from God, it went down to someone else, and somehow it got into my hands. I don't know how it happened, but somehow God put a blessing or put a seed in your life. He put some seed in your hands. How many guys have God put seed in your hands right now? He, he put seed in your hands. Okay. Okay. He's put seed in your hands. And if he's put seed in your hands, it's not meant to stop with you. The seed is not meant to die in your hands. It's meant to bring more life. Right now, poverty exists in different cities around the world because there are people that have been hoarding the seed that is meant to bless them. It is plugged the flow. So God, God is like this river. It's this river and it flows and we're in the river and we're flowing. But, but when we stop the seed from flowing, when we stop the seed from blessing, we stop people from being blessed. And right now people are in lack and poverty because we've stopped the seed. We plugged the flow. Oh man, I knew it was going to get quiet on this one. I knew it. But when you release the seed, when you, come on, someone say release the seed. When you release the seed, you align yourself under the blessings of God. You align yourself. The Bible says that he'll open up the windows of heaven. He says, test me in this. Only, I mean, so for those of you guys who came from the streets, you know when someone says, try me, test me, you know they're, they're being serious. you like, try, oh, oh, you think I'm talking? All right, try me. Hit me. Just hit me. Try me. You know, they're, okay, this person's probably messing around. You know, you know, and, and, and I, I'm not saying God's getting gangster on us or nothing, but, but what God is actually saying is, I want you to try me in this because I'm very confident in my word and I'm confident in what I say. And I'm not just telling you this thing for some fluff. I'm letting you know this because I want you to be in line with the blessing of God. But when we hoard our seed, we, it's like a weed that chokes out our blessing. It chokes out our harvest. And the harvest that God wants to get to you, the harvest that maybe was intended for this month and this year, could have been choked out because we've been hoarding the seed. And instead of putting the seed in the ground in the house of God, we kept it on our own two hands. God super convicted me. Super convicted me. Because I, I, I wrote down, I wrote down, I wrote that I, I, I bought a brick, I bought, I, or whatever. I bought, I, bought, I bought a couple bricks. Where'd they go? Oh, there they are. I bought a couple bricks, and, and, I, I, and, and, and my goal was to give, and, and, and I don't want to get into details of how all my accounts work and everything works out. Basically, the point is, 
I missed the deadline. And I thought, oh, it's okay. I mean, I could, st- I could still just give it. And it's true, I could. But I started, but, but, but because I, I missed the deadline, I stopped. I, I just kind of kept brushing it off and brushing it off and brushing it off. One day I woke up in the middle of the night. And, and I felt this sense of, like, insecurity in a sense in my finances. This sense of, this sense of fear or worry in what I was, and what I had. And I realized this, I was holding on to the seed that I had promised God. It was like three in the morning or four in the morning. I was up for like five hours working out all my accounts, everything to make sure I said, I'm not going another minute with this seed in my hand. This belongs in the house of God. Now I'm just being honest with you. I'm gonna be transparent and real. And when I did that, yes, there's less money in my bank account, but I got blessing written on my name from heaven. And I feel so much more at peace. I feel so much, so much more ready for what God has for me. Not only that, but I'm sitting here like, God, when are you going to bless me? And I can live that way and I can expect that. Why? Because I know God is true to his word. He honors what he says and he does not lie. But because I was hoarding the seed, I couldn't see that and I hindered my harvest. But because I finally released the seed, I know harvest is coming. And it is coming, believe me. Here's another thing that comes, up, that comes along with money that we need to understand. What you love, you end up obeying. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some have wandered away from the faith and impaled themselves with a lot of pain because they made money their goal. Notice it says the love of money, the love for money. Now we love, anything you love, you begin to obey, you start living for, you start sacrificing for. When, when we were, you know, how many of you guys know when you were back in your, your super honeymoon love days, I'm t- speaking for the more mature folks in the place. You guys were up on the phone late at night. You, were, you guys were, I mean, buying everything in the world. I, I say that because I'm kind of there right now. But, <laughs> but uh, you guys understand what, you guys understand that there's, you start bang, you p- buying, paying for things. You start doing things and you pour a lot into it. A lot of attention, a lot of things into it. But when you put, when you have love in money, it's like putting, it's like putting, It's like trying to reach the bottom of a bottomless pit. It's not going to come. It's not going to happen. And the fulfillment you're looking for will never, ever be there. The root is different than the fruit. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. There's There's different kinds of evil in our life. We start losing integrity. We start lying on different things. We start becoming a different person. You see, someone gives you extra change at the Stater Bros or whatever, and you're just like... God, you must have been blessing me. <laughs> and I mean, I know that sounds really light, but the truth is that love of money becomes a root for different kinds of evil. And it's rooted not just when it comes to finances, but it changes your integrity. And if your integrity is compromised, your character is compromised, and you start making decisions that are out of line with the word of God because of the love of money. Oh, man. I didn't want to preach on this, but, but I had to. Because the, the Lord, I mean, this is the word for us tonight. Lord, speak your word. The love for money. This is interesting. The love for money, not fame, not the devil, not different things. This is the love of money is the root. The love of money is the root. We start losing integrity. We start, it causes, it causes us to make decisions we would have never made before because of our love for money. One last scripture on this. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says this. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. It says that in the word. How meaningless to think that when we get more money, we'll be happier. Haven't we said that before? And then we got more and then we weren't, still weren't happy. We still wanted more. And then we said that again and then you got more and all of a sudden it just, it didn't do anything for you. And no matter how much you make, you're always going to look at the next level like I need that. And this isn't to say that God doesn't want to bless you and give you prosperity, but we're trying to work off of the world's uh, economy. But God is saying, I want to give you the kingdom economy. I want to give you God's economy. And this is blessing even in a dark place. This is, la- this is no worry. This is no fear. And God can bless you better than you could bless yourself. Believe me. Allow your seed to be in the house of God and watch what God will do for you. 
We're getting ready for a really, really big day coming up. And we got these bricks right here represent this opportunity for us to sow a seed. Some of these bricks have your name on it and you didn't even realize your name was on one of those bricks. We think this is for somebody else. We think this is for the person next to you. We think this is just for the leaders. We think this is just for that person that always gives and excited to. No, this is for you. There's a, there's, a, there's a vision in there. There's ministry in there. There's breakthrough in there. There's transformation in there. And someone has your name written all over those bricks and we just need to open our eyes and realize don't hoard what you have, plant what you have, and God can do incredible things and release a harvest for you in Jesus' name. If you believe that, give God a little bit of praise. We'll go on to our last point. So we learned how there's three different type of weeds that choke us out, anxiety and worry, and then the love for money. And then third, as it says right there in verse 19, it says, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the third one, the desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. See, whatever you desire more, most in your life will set the DNA, will set the course of your life, will set the, the whole entire course of your life. Whatever it is you desire most, whatever, whatever it is you love most, whatever it is that's at the top of your list, whatever it is that's number one in your life will set the course for the rest of your life. You, you desire money, that's gonna set the course for your life, and it's never, it's gonna be a bottomless pit. You desire the sins of this world, that's gonna set the course of your life. But you desire God, and God is gonna set the course for your life. How many guys are saying, I want God to set the course of my life, no one else, or nothing else? Matthew 6, says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. See, we think sometimes God is trying to take from us. He's trying to give. He's trying to give to you. God is not trying to take anything from you except your pain, except your anxiety, except your sin, except destruction, except the thing that tears you down, except your fear, except your insecurity. Those are the things he's trying to take from you so that he can give you life in abundance, so that he can give you peace at night, so that he can give you hope, so that he can give you joy, so he can give you forgiveness of your sin, things that we should be paying for, he wants to give you freedom from. See, the world wants us to pay for the things we did, but God is saying, let me pay for that. Let me pay the price on the cross so you can be set free and walk in freedom from this day forward. That's what God wants to give us. Grace and mercy and love and his power. That's what he wants to give us. And we think God's trying to take away. He's not trying to take anything away except the things that have been hurting us. But God is saying, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first my kingdom. Not the world's kingdom, not the world's standards, not what the world has to offer, not status, not fame, not a position, but seek my kingdom first. Test me, try me, try me in these things. God is saying, just bring the tithe. He says, try me, trust me. God says, my word won't return void. You seek me first, and all these things, all in one package, will be added on to you. What is it that we're lacking in life? It comes from God. What is it that we're looking for? It comes from the Lord. What is it that you're trying to search for? You're trying to find. It's in the hands of God. Trust the Lord. He will give it to you, and he will never let you down. If you believe that, give God a little praise, because he has something for you. He has something for you. See, this is another thing we need to understand. Seeking God first, and I taught this to the young adults, seeking God first doesn't mean adding God like a cherry on top of your life. Okay, I got everything in order. I got what I want. I want to where I want to live, what I want to do, person I want to be with, all these different things, and then I'll add God like a cherry on top of the whipped cream and everything that I decorated so neatly. God's not a cherry on top of your life. When, you, when we say seek God first, it doesn't mean put him at the cherry on top. It means begin with him at the foundations of your life. It means build the entire life upon the cross, upon his word. Don't end with him, start with him. God wants to be the foundation of your life and he wants to build on top of that. God doesn't want to step on you and crush you. He wants you to build on him. He says, I'll carry the burden. I will carry the weight. I will carry your fears and pains. I will carry your concerns in life. Begin with me and watch what we can do together in this world. He wants to be the foundation. 
Not the cherry on top. Tweet that. Put that on Instagram. God's the foundation, not the cherry on top. Seeking God first, it's like a domino effect. That first domino. First domino. There's things in our life. We're just waiting for something to change. We're waiting for something to happen. God is saying, just, if you would just trust me, I will make everything else fall into place. And it all com comes with one package. So the domino effect, the, the way it works is you don't have to kick down every domino one by one. You just start with the first. How many of us are trying to hold on to our life like loose ends and like, like, uh, like a dog trying to chase 100 tennis balls we just threw at him? He, he's not going to even catch one. How many of us are just like running around trying to figure out our life and all God is saying, just focus on what's first in your life. Focus on what's number one priority in your life. Focus on what's number one. And that number one needs to be me because I'm going to give you everything that you need. I'm not going to let you down. And I'm going to set off like a domino effect in your life then I am not going to stop and it's all going to come as one package over and over and over it says seek me first and all these things will be added unto you all these blessings got your name written on it the moment you choose God as your number one all these blessings you don't have to worry about oh oh God I wonder if you give me a oh, second best and maybe he saved the best for someone else no God says all my blessings belong to you the entire inheritance has your name on it all the blessings Blessings, all the favor, all the miracles, all the transformation, the vision, the breakthrough. It has your name on it. Someone say, my name is on that blessing. Your name is on it. We need to claim that. But God's got to be number one in our lives. Because God's a God of order. God's, God's not like, yeah, just mix me in there somewhere. God says, this has to be in order. Put me as number one. Put me, put me, so begin with me at the foundation. See, this whole building is beautiful. This church is gorgeous. I mean, there's paint on the walls, and little by little, you, we start seeing things added. You know, there's maybe a paint, and the youth are building the cafe right now. It's looking, it's, it's, it's building, it's looking great. We're building a lot of things we're adding here and there. But you know what's something we can't do? We can't pick this building up and redo the foundation. We can't pick this building up and expect to redo what we begin with. See, what we need to realize is that you don't build on top of other things and God is like a wall in your life. No, he's a foundation. We start with him. We need to redo. We need a reset button on life. What we need to do is start over, start from scratch, get a blank slate, a blank piece of paper, and begin here. God, you are number one. Everything else follows after that. I'm going to be in the house of God. I'm going to serve you faithfully. I'm going to live my life for you because I believe in your word. I believe in what you said about me. I believe in your promises. I believe in your power. I believe in your miracles. I believe you could set me free. I believe you are the way, the truth, and the life. I believe there is no one like you. Jesus, come on, if you believe that Jesus is number one, give him some praise tonight. He's worthy. He's worthy of praise. He's worthy of praise. Jesus said that, John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. We need to not have any close seconds to that. There's no close seconds to God. In Luke 14, 26, if you want to be my disciples, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. That's harsh, but it's real. What does he mean? Basically, he's very urgent in saying this. Let there be no close seconds in your life. Because anytime you have someone in your life that's a close second, they can easily sway you back and forth. I got someone who's playing for first place and they're battling it out. It could be you, it could be God and money. It could be God and your position. It could be God and, and a drug. It could be God and an addiction. It could be God and a person. It could be God and anything else in this world. And as long as they play a close second on your down days, you're going to start looking elsewhere. And that enemy is going to be prowling around waiting for you to be weak. And he's going to begin to sway. Let there be no close seconds in your life. Let there be no one that comes close to your relationship with God. No one comes close to God being number one. Because if God is number one, 
Come on. He is going to bless you like you've never been blessed before. Your peace comes from Him. Your joy comes from Him. Your hope comes from the Lord. Come on. How many know that my joy, my peace comes from Jesus? It doesn't come from nobody else. I'm done looking forward in my finances. I'm done looking forward in relationships. I'm done looking forward in the world. I'm coming to God. I'm coming to Him. And I'm going to find my peace. I'm going to find my joy in the Lord. Because He's everything that I need. Come on, if you believe that, just give God some praise. Wow, wasn't that just amazing? Would you give me the second and allow me to pray with you? Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Father God, we just come to you, Father, and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the clarity and the revelation that you have brought forth, Father. I pray right now, God, for the brother or sister that's on the other side of this lens watching, God. I pray that you meet them right where they're at, God, and I pray that you meet all their needs according to your riches and your glory, Father. We give you honor, praise, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. So if this word has blessed you and you would like to partner with us, you can do so by clicking the link on the top or the link at the bottom. And WayFam, we'll see you on the next sermon.